Hey everybody, Victor here, and for today I have a guide specifically dedicated to how sieges in EU4 actually work. Now the reason why I wanted to make this guide particularly is because a friend of mine who recently started making EU4 meme videos for YouTube, and I'll link his channel in a comment below in case you guys are interested in that, made a comment in his most recent video where he said that he just doesn't understand how sieges work in this game. Now, he was being completely sarcastic when he said that, but it made me realize there's probably a lot of people that don't. And this is because, for the most part, when new people join our community, and they ask, how do I make my sieges take less time? Or, how do sieges work? They get told, just get some artillery, blockade it if it's a coastal fort, and wait. And while that is true, and it's solid advice, it doesn't fully explain how sieges work, and that full understanding might make it so you get to avoid those 10-year-long sieges that we all hate. So let's go ahead and get started with this guide by jumping in with Milan. Now I'm pretty sure the first thing you guys are going to notice is that there's a chart across the top of the screen that's for some reason not there when you guys play EU4. Now what this chart is for is to help me teach you guys why some forts seem to have a different percentage than others, and there is actually a very good reason. You see, this starting bonus at the top, what that means is it's these four numbers here added together. So you have the general siege pips, artillery bonus, depending on how many artillery you have, whether or not the coastal fort is blockaded or not, and then fort level. Now just so you're aware, you do not get a bonus to your sieging if it is blockaded. What happens is if it is not blockaded, this is negative two, meaning you lose two whatever advantages you might have. And I'll explain what these actually mean in a little bit. But basically, by adding these together, you're at positive 3, which, according to this chart, would mean I'm at negative 14.29%. Now, if I take my artillery here and move them off of this fort, you'll notice I jump up to negative 49%. The reason why is because I no longer have the plus 5, so I'm at negative 2. And if I move over here to Monferrato, I now have negative 7, because I have all of the five artillery bonuses and only negative one here, which means I'm at positive four, so I'm at negative 7.14. And if I have my other infantry move over, nothing changes because none of these bonuses have changed. Now that I've explained that, so you guys can quickly see at a glance whether or not you have bonuses or not and whether or not you should be able to boost them or not based on what these percentages happen to be, given the fact that you guys should know what fort level it is, let's move on to how you boost them up. In fact, the best thing to talk about now is not how to increase your bonuses, but it's why you should care, which goes into the fundamental mechanics of what's going on every time one of these 30-day siege ticks ends. You see, every 30 days, you are rolling a 14-sided die. The percentage here is deceptive. That really isn't what you're looking at. Instead, you're rolling this 14-sided die, and depending on what you roll, certain things will happen. If you ever roll a 1, from beginning to game to end to game, you get a disease outbreak. So you have a 1 in 14 chance every single siege tick of getting a disease outbreak. So sometimes you're just unlucky. But every other time, certain things will happen. As you can see, you have a supply shortage between 5 and 11. Seems simple enough. Everything between the 1 and 5, so the 2, 3, and 4, that's a status quo. And then finally, you have defenders deserting at 16 to 18 but that should tip you off. You can't roll a 16 to an 18 on a 14 sided dice. Instead what happens is whatever the sum of this is, is added as a bonus, called the starting bonus, to your roll. Which means the higher amount of cannons that you have, the lower level of fort, whether or not you blockade them or not, etc. all matters because it's added to this d14 roll. So you want as many points here as you possibly can. Now, all you're trying to do is get to a 20. As long as you can roll a 20, you're good. It does not matter how else you get there. You can get a 25, you're still at 20, you'll get the surrender and allowing you to occupy the fort. So all you're trying to do is give enough bonuses to yourself to be able to roll a 20 or higher. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. Obviously, a six siege general would be amazing because it'll add six points. Having all five points from artillery also helps as well. Being able to blockade them so you don't get the negative two helps. And going after capital forts versus normal forts helps. But there's other ways of boosting this too, and that is what we're going to talk about when it comes to boosting your points up, either bonus points or otherwise. 
So let's go ahead and talk about ways to boost it naturally without any actual action on your part. There are a couple of ways that you can get bonus points over here throughout the course of a siege, and the first one I'm going to talk about is breaching walls. You see, there are two ways to get this bonus. You either click the button down here, which seems pretty obvious. You click the button, you'll get some progress done. However, the other one is the natural wall breach. Now, as far as the natural one is concerned, the math is not publicly available as to what increases your odds of it happening. Whether it is by having all five of the artillery bonus points, having more than that, we're not sure. However, whenever you get one naturally, you get one point in the wall breached here, with a maximum being of three. When you click the button, you get three just at flat. Which means, even if you get one naturally, it might still be worth it for you to click the button, because it'll give you more bonus points. And now, as you can tell, I'm at positive 14%. The reason why is, if you recall that chart, I'm at positive 7, which means now I have a 20 and a 21 as a possible roll, which, given the percentage of me rolling that number, is 14%. That's all those mean. The odds of me rolling a 14 or a 13, which gets added with 7, which will allow me to get a surrender, is 14% of total. That's it. Now that that has been talked about, let's talk about other ways that you get progress, and I'll go ahead and just reset this fort over here. So I can talk about the next phase, which is actually just letting the fort proceed. So while you are standing on a fort waiting for it to be sieged down, you'll be making rolls. And whenever you roll the supply, food or water shortages, or the defenders deserting, so not the disease outbreak or status quo, you'll be getting bonus points over here. And the amount of points you get depends on what you roll. So if you get a supply shortage, it's plus one. A water shortage is plus three which means you're hoping for certain results because of course you are. So I'm going to let this progress, and as you see, I got a water shortage, so now I have three bonus points. By getting these three bonus points, that kicked me up to positive 7, which means positive 14%. The reason why this is 14% now is because both a 14 and a 13 on my die roll will give me 20 or 21, both of which count for a surrender, and that's 14% of the time that that will occur. If I wanted to boost it up even higher, I'd blast open the fort, because now I have these three as well, meaning I have a total of positive 10, making it 35% of the time. Now, there are other ways that you can boost this up. Again, siege general pips, etc. But this one right here goes to a maximum of 12. This is why at some point your fort sieges just seem to get stagnant. They just sit there. They're not progressing anymore because you're constantly trying to roll that little bit more, or that one specific number. If you see a siege that's not seeming to progress, even though you're getting water shortages, make certain you're not capped out here, because you might only have one or two dice rolls that you could get to end the siege, and that can still take a while. So instead of doing that, look at other ways to boost this, and now let's talk about how you can go ahead and boost your bonus points up to make these sieges last a lot less. And welcome to the Age of Revolutions. I brought you here because during this age, sieging can get kind of nuts in a couple of different ways, and I wanted to show you guys all of it, and this is the best place to do it. The first thing to talk about, though, is actually coastal forts, which I'm not sure if I actually brought up before. You see, whenever you're dealing with a coastal fort, you end up having to blockade them. If you do not blockade them, you get negative two, to your progress over here because you lose bonus points. However, if you look in one of the images up here, I have mortars. This is an option you have for your flagship. And what this will do is if you do blockade them in 100%, this will not get set to zero as it normally would, but will give you a bonus point. That is why mortars can be so very, very useful because it makes it so blockading actually does help with sieging, not just gets it to like its normal in actual territory, non-coastal forts. So that is why mortars are very nice. Now if you also notice here, I have a lot more in terms of artillery bonuses, and that is because later on you're able to increase the amount you have through the splendor bonus of Napoleonic Warfare. A lot of people have taken this, and I've seen this in multiplayer, and they seem to think it just gives them a plus three generally. This only works if you actually have enough artillery in your siege stacks. So actually look. And as you can see by the image in front of you, up here, it goes up to nine. 
Now the reason why it goes up to nine is because if you go into the merchant, if you have 50% trade power in a node, you can turn on improved inland routes. This will make it so you have plus one as an option as well, though again, you still have to have enough artillery to actually earn that. So just be aware, if you turn that on, that does not actually mean you're automatically getting that bonus. And that's a couple of ways on how you can drastically increase it immediately. However, there's a couple of more ways that can happen. As you can see, this is a fort level eight, which means fort level eight. But right here, let me find one that's, there we go, Toledo. Let's walk to Toledo. Okay, I can't walk to Toledo. I'm gonna go ahead and figure out what's causing this to stop and I'm going to get to Toledo and bring you guys back. See you in a second. And welcome to Toledo. Now here you can see, even though it has a fort level of two, I have plus one. The reason why is every time you upgrade your fort level, if you're sieging down a inadequate fort or an older fort, you get bonus points. I get plus three to this because even though I'm able to build level eight forts, since this is a level two, you get a bonus point for every time you're back in fort line. So I can build eight, that's plus one, plus two, plus three. Capitals are not counted in here. So if you go to a capital over here, I don't suddenly get plus four because it doesn't work that way. As you can see, once I get over here, I'm just waiting for it, there we go. Instead, I just get plus two because again, I'm getting plus three. It would have to be a no province, a no fort province, which I just get for free. So by doing this, you're able to get yourself very, very easy sieges just by waiting until you have the right tech where you upgrade your fort level, then attack them to siege them down quickly because their forts are obsolete. This is why you need to upgrade your forts because this is why they fall so fast. They're getting bonus points just because they're obsolete. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, let's go ahead and bring that up, and that is how siege ability and fort defense actually work. So both siege ability and fort defensiveness, what they do is they modify the amount of time it takes between these rolls of the dice to progress your siege. Now, the base amount of time between them is 30 days. Siege ability will reduce that amount of time, defensiveness increases that amount of time. And what it happens is it takes the comparison of those two percents, the total defensiveness versus the total siege ability. And whatever one is the higher number, whatever the difference is, has that effect. So as you can see, in total, the defensiveness is 31.9%. The siege ability is 52.9%, meaning there's about a 20% difference in siege ability's favor, which means it modifies that 30 days by reducing it by about 20%, meaning it's 23 days, not 30. If, however, defensiveness had a 20% advantage, it would be adding seven days. Pretty simplistic. So why do you need to care about this? Well, the more of an advantage you have in siege ability, the faster you'll be able to take out ports, like on a mountain fort. And this is important because you get that negative two dice roll if they attack you on it. So the less time you're spending here, the better it will be for you, because it gives them less time to attack you and push you off. On the other hand, you want your own fort to be as defensive as possible to stop them from moving on as fast as possible. And this is why I want to talk about fort defense. See, a lot of people are still taking defensive ideas. And you shouldn't be. It's a bad idea group. It just is. It used to be the meta, and they nerfed it into the ground. You see, the morale that you get out of it is just not worth an entire idea group. And the defensiveness, you can get enough elsewhere. And I wanted to explain why. Because I see a lot of people not taking advantage of this. Well, you can get some defensiveness by building on a mountain. 25% is really good. You also get it on a hill province. 10% is really good. Same with salt, 15%. Lastly, you can build a rampart for another 15%. And it all adds up. So simply by finding a mountain fort, throwing down a rampart, you're able to go from 25% to 40%. And if you look here, he only has, late game, 52%. A lot of people are only going to have around 52 to maybe 60%. So you're really not going to be that low when it comes to that. However, on top of that, there is one more, and that is the Defensive Edict. So as you can see here, he had the advantage of 7 days, because he has 20% more Siege Ability. So let's go ahead and throw on the Defensive Edict for 33%, 
and see how fast that shifts it. It went from 23 days to 33 days, so a 10 day shift. And that might not sound like a lot. It's 10 days. This is a game that takes place over 400 years. It's a long game. So why would 10 days matter? Well, let's take this in the precision of how large you should be. See, this is historical France. Most of us are going to be yay big at around this point at a minimum. Which means you might have to move your troops from Portugal over here all the way over here in order to fight over here and they're sieging down your fort. Now, if you don't have enough fort defensiveness, by the time you get there, they're going to be over here, which is obviously a problem. If you have enough, you might make it in time, but let's say it takes two years. They'll take 24 siege ticks in total for them to occupy this province. Now, if you only have 30 days, that's two years. However, if you increase it just to 35 days, which really isn't that much of an increase in defensiveness, it is pretty much the difference of a rampart. I think it's 15 or 16% defensiveness. That makes it so instead of it taking two years to get 24 siege ticks, it's suddenly taking two years and five months. Five months because it's now 35 days between them. So even though it would only take, you'd get 20 ticks within a two year period, it takes an extra month just to get that extra one. So it gives you five more months by building one rampart. That's all you're doing, one rampart. And this is why I recommend you building them whenever you're looking at somebody on your border that might actually attack you or might actually be a problem trying to siege, them, siege you out because this way you're buying yourself a lot of time. And every single fort you can prevent them from taking, you are therefore making it so it's quicker war for you. Because every time they take this fort, then this one, then this one, and they start pushing in, you now have to go back after you're sieging them out and re-siege your own stuff back. On top of which, any war exhaustion that would be ticking up from them occupying it and lost war score and everything else. So increase your fort defensiveness, use the advantages of ramparts or defensive edicts, please. I see a lot of people forgetting those, especially in multiplayer and you're handicapping yourself really, really bad. But with all of that being said, that should be enough for you guys to be able to understand how sieges work and be able to take advantage of them. I will say that there's actually a couple of other ways you can get more bonus points. Look on the wiki, basically Norman ideas, some Portuguese things. There are other ways to make siege ticks even shorter in terms of these bonuses. So do look on there because there's also information on there. And lastly, if you're ever fighting somebody and you're able to sally forth and fight them, like I can here because it's not 10 to 1, so I won't get stack wiped, move your army over right before you engage, send these guys out, because they'll take up space on the front line, and these guys are free manpower. You do not have to replenish these with this manpower. These guys you do. So use the soldiers in here to help force them off the province, you'll replenish them for free. But if you like this kind of content, like and subscribe. I will definitely be making more guides, whether it's for nation guides or mechanics guides. If you wanted me to do a specific mechanic or country or whatever it happens to be, leave it in the comment below. I'd be more than happy to do it. Also, I will again put the link to my friend's YouTube channel in a comment below. But with all that being said, thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day.